My name is Lynette Roth and I am Daimler Curator of the Bush Reisinger Museum and Head of the Division of Modern and Contemporary Art and I will be serving as a moderator for Q&A later on. I want to thank you uh, for joining uh, this session uh, in our series, Our Talks Live. Um, but before we begin today, although we're only virtually uh, at the Harvard Art Museums, I would also like to acknowledge that Harvard University is situated on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Massachusetts people, and we strive to honor this relationship. Today, as in our talks previously, uh, we offer an up-close look at works from our collections with our team of curators, conservators, fellows, and graduate students. And you can join us on Zoom every other Thursday afternoon at 2 p.m. for these short interactive talks, which along with our ongoing Art Talks video series, investigate uh, artist materials and techniques, reveal our latest discoveries, offer a fresh look at old favorites, and explore big ideas using the collections of the Harvard Art Museums. Before we begin, just a few logistics. We are using the webinar format in Zoom, so you will notice that your microphones are muted and your videos are not visible. So instead, we invite you to submit, submit brief questions via the Q&A box, which you should be able to access at the bottom of your screen. The presentation today will last approximately 15 minutes, and we will dedicate the last 15 minutes to Q&A. And while I'll do my best to get to every question, uh, we once again have a large uh, group today, so I may not be able to address them all. And do feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box during the presentation, but we probably won't answer them until the end. And we will conclude today's talk uh, at around 2.30 p.m. So now I am very pleased to introduce our speaker today, Shiva Mihan, Schroeder Curatorial Fellow in Islamic Art. And Shiva joined the museums in the fall of 2018 and as a highly experienced codicologist who is also fluent in Persian and Arabic, Shiva brought a thorough knowledge of the Islamic arts of the book to the collections at the Harvard Art Museums, deciphering, deciphering even the most ambiguous scripts to catalog some 400 objects during her tenure and also contribute uh, to important installations of that collection. Today, Shiva will be sharing with us her talk, a Persian calligraphy album. So with that, I turn it over to Shiva. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Art Talks Live. My name is Shiva Mihan. I am Shirdir Curatorial Fellow in Islamic Art and I'm specialist of Islamic manuscripts and Persian art. I'm very excited to look at an album of Persian calligraphy with you today. First, I will briefly talk about the importance of calligraphy in Islamic art and the motives behind compiling albums of calligraphy. Then we will look at the uh, artworks and the calligraphers, and at the end, I will say a few words about the donor of this precious object. I want to uh, just to start with saying that the idea of the art talk series is to take a closer look at an object of art, but um, the one object that I have chosen today consists of 36 pieces of calligraphy. So bear with me. The reason I chose an album of calligraphy for today is that calligraphy is the most highly regarded element of Islamic art. That's because the holiest book in Islam, the Quran, was transmitted in Arabic script. If we regard the paucity of imagery in early centuries after Islam, at least in what uh, that has come down to us, we understand why the artist deployed the inherent characteristic of the script to creatively use writing as ornament and in various decorative forms. The development of calligraphy as an art form is not limited to Islamic culture. It was the same in some other countries, think of Chinese calligraphy or the European illuminated Bibles. 
Um, but in the countries with an Islamic cultural heritage, calligraphy has been exploited uh, in numerous imaginative ways, uh, which have taken the um, written word far beyond paper and pen, and uh, has taken uh, to the realms of uh, art forms and visual materials. Calligraphers intelligently harmonized the uh, practical aspect, which was uh, transmitting text with the aesthetic expressions of visual elements. All this makes calligraphy the iconic feature of Islamic art, and with that is associated a great respect for books <clears throat> and manuscript production. Collecting single folio artworks, whether detached from a codex or initially created separately and then gathered together, was carried out for three main reasons. First, in order to preserve the separate artwork in a, a secure folder and protect them from wear and tear. Second, for educational purposes, to pass models to the next generations of calligraphers for artists to copy and learn from. And uh, in later times, single sheet artworks were gathered into albums to create a visually pleasing collection mainly to be appreciated by uh, connoisseurs and rulers. As a result, some calligraphers and artists began to produce individual works specifically for album inclusion. Harvard album of Persian calligraphy was compiled with all three motives in mind. It contains 36 pages of calligraphy by at least eight calligraphers. All pages are bound in accordion format after the folios were uniformly uh, framed in papers in various colors. We are not sure when the album was compiled, but a small note suggests that it entered the library of a prince in 1854. He was the 17th son of the Qajar crown prince um, Abbas Mirza, and his name was Ihtisham Dole. The Qajar dynasty ruled Iran from 1789 to 1925. The album opens to a beautifully illuminated text in praise of God. The heading is decorated with intricate um, elements, uh, like floral motifs. Uh, you can see them better probably in this slide, which are iconic to Qajar art. The two colors that you see in here are gold and silver. Uh, silver was used to provide a green shade for gold, probably more visible in this slide. All folios have attributions in the margins which seems accurate and were very probably done by a connoisseur in the 19th century. These calligraphic works can be dated from the 16th to the early 19th centuries. For those of you who are less familiar with Islamic calligraphy, uh, I should add a silver calligraphic style developed and modeled. Each was used for a specific purpose. Some were highly decorative, like those applied in Islamic architecture. Some were easy to read, which made them appropriate for books. And uh, some were hard to read and even decipher, which were mainly used in chancery or financial documents. The two scripts that we have in this album are Ta'liq and Shakaste. Ta'liq means suspended or suspension. Ashokasta means broken. The two old scripts that I mentioned belong to the hard to read category and were usually practiced by highly educated administrators and statesmen. The two oldest folios in this album are written in Tali the script. You see them, they, they look like hanging from um, a thread or something. They are um, by the very famous uh, calligraphy master, 
Khadja Akhtiar Din Munshi, who was an administrator in the Safavid court in the 16th century Iran. And his signed works are dated between 1542 and 1567. This is a uh, poetic letter on the right. Um, probably written to a loved one because it has extremely delicate uh, metaphors. Uh, needless to say, despite the strong association of Islamic calligraphy with the holy book of Islam, uh, it was used also for um, non-religious text and we see that it was uh, deployed widely to transcribe secular texts such as uh, panegyric poems, epics, love, love letters and love poems, and um, here in the left, we see the calligraphy instructions of how to join this entire script. Again, it shows how they were compiled to uh, bring a model to the future generations to practice. The artists who practice calligraphy were very highly skilled and trained for years to master their art. But most of them were also well versed in poetry. These are the list of calligraphers whose uh, work we see in this album. The commissioner or compiler of this album has tried to include works by eminent calligraphers such as Shafi O, Darvish, and Mirza Kuchak Esfahani. In addition to many literary and poetic calligraphy works, this album also contains several letters uh, written by Prince Governor Farhad Mirza, like this example that we see here, and the attribution, his name appears at the top. He was a highly educated bibliophile with an outstanding collection of exquisite manuscripts. It was necessary for a government, uh, for a governor to have beautiful handwriting. It's interesting that those letters are included in this album that his younger brother had commissioned and compiled. So he was the fifth son of Abbas Mirza and the compiler was the 17th son of Abbas Mirza. The quality of his hand is distinguishable to an untrained eye, perhaps the magic of Persian calligraphy lies in harmony of orality and visuality of Persian poetry and calligraphy in these albums. So when you read the poem in Persian language, it is the brush strokes um, and pen strokes that you see in the calligraphy. Um, in the end, I want to talk about the um, collector of this uh, works of art. The album belonged to a, uh, the collection of Azad Malik Sudawar. Um, she was an erudite discerning connoisseur and a passionate collector. Uh, and also she was a generous benefactor. Uh, she was born in Iran in 1913 and died in Tehran a century later in 2014. Uh, <clears throat> her father was the founder of Iran's largest private collection containing marvels of manuscripts, um, textiles, um, coins, stamps, paintings, and uh, lacquer works. Um, probably the most important part were lacquer works, and uh, they are now preserved in the Malik National Library and Museum uh, and are available to public use. Her major interest was in the arts of the Qajar period, but uh, in her fabulous collection, which is on long term loan to Harvard Art Museums. Uh, we see that she has um, beautiful manuscripts from much earlier periods. Um, I think with her life devoted to Persian art, Azad Malik Sudawa has been an inspiration for the younger generation um, to appreciate the artistic heritage and also to collectors to donate artworks. 
and uh, very rare work in museums and um, make them available for scholars, art lovers, and researchers. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you so much, Shiva. Um, actually, maybe you can just leave this wonderful slide um, up for us as we enter our Q&A session. We already have some great uh, questions in the chat. Um, one related to the collector that you were just discussing, uh, the question is, was it unusual uh, for a woman to collect in this manner? Thank you, Lynette. Uh, it, it's a very interesting question because we do not have that many women collectors, uh, first of all, in Iran. And she was an exception. Um, she came from a family of, with a, a long history of collecting objects. As I mentioned, her father was the founder of Malik uh, Museum and um, she probably grew up in this environment of appreciation of Persian and Islamic art. Uh, she traveled widely and she um, tried to purchase anything that she could find um, in the auctions outside of Iran and bring them back to the country. Uh, I think she was a um, unique example. Um, at least I cannot uh, remember any female collector in Iran with such a um, fantastic passion for collecting and for this variety of materials and media that uh, she has in, uh, she had in her collection. And we have a great collection of uh, lacquer works. Um, we had this uh, exhibition of um, the lacquer works that he, she donated to our museum and uh, the uh, catalog is also available if someone is interested, I think I have it here. Yes, there is a lot of interest actually in the question and answer and um, also in seeing a photograph of her. I don't know oh, if that's okay. something you have in the book, but... Um, yeah, it's so great that I have this book um, close to me, so... I think there are a few images of her. I'm trying to find. <laughs> Perhaps um, our assistant Matthew could put the um, link to the book or the title of the book in the chat for those who are interested in uh, following up on, on that as well. Uh, Shiva, we have a lot. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> we have a lot of questions. Um, yes. And many of them actually have to do, you, you explained so beautifully um, how the works in the album dating from the 16th um, to the 19th century were compiled later. Uh, and there were a lot of questions about that compilation. Uh, so, for example, um, do, don't the original um, works, do they lose anything important or interesting information in that act of, of compilation? So out of their original context. Uh, and I had a related question in that as you were researching this, did you, did you question any of those 19th century attributions? Oh, yes, I answered the second part first. I uh, did that by comparing the um, trusted artworks by those calligraphers uh, with the pieces that we had to see if the attributions were correct or not. And in most cases, I found they were accurate. And that's why I thought that that must have been done by a connoisseur in the 19th century, um, probably at the same time that the album was com being compiled. And uh, the first question, yes, I think this kind of um, compiling albums um, will not include the whole character of the object as it had individually, or if it was part of a manuscript or another collection before. 
um, first of all, we do not know what is at the back of these artworks. So there must have been some notes, signatures, dates, seals. Uh, we do not know. Um, and also, if we look at, for example, these letters, we see that the letters were reporting some um, daily matters in the state and they are now in an album of calligraphy to appreciate the, um, the skill of the calligrapher. But probably we, we, we do not mean, uh, um, pay so much attention to the art, uh, to the historical side, in addition to the art historical side of these uh, letters, because they are telling us what was going on in the court, what was the prince governor doing, who was going to, I don't know, to what, to what mission and uh, lots of information about the prices, tradings and lots of things. And uh, I think in this album, they have lost all those information, the worth of those information probably, and they have been narrowed to just a beautiful um, artwork. Hmm. Yeah, there was a question too about um, when the attribution is inscribed in the border decoration, could it ever be a signature? Were they never signed? They would have signed. Uh, we have lots of artworks that um, were signed at this um, during these periods, like from um, late 15th, early 16th century, we see that the um, signatures appear in the in paintings and uh, calligraphies. Um, before that also, if it was a manuscript, uh, most of the times, or if it was a calligraphy specimen, we see that the scribe leaves the name there. So these are not the signatures of the uh, calligraphers themselves, but they were attributions later on. After framing the artwork, they were added because they are uh, not on the uh, paper that the calligraphy was being done on it, but it is on the borders. And um, yeah, so um, we, we are sure that they were not done by the uh, calligraphers themselves, mm -hmm. they were added later. Um, and could you say something about the choice of the mounts? Um, it's, it's noticeable, obviously, the, the different colors that were chosen for the mounting. Would this would have been typical of a uh, potentially 19th century album? Yeah, in lots of uh, 19th century albums, we see that uh, they used colorful papers to frame the uh, objects, um, whether they are like fingernail art, calligraphy, painting or drawings. We see that practice. And uh, also we see these uh, multiple borders from uh, various papers. Some of them have in this slide that we have here. If you see in this um, orange line, there are some gold speckle and uh, they beautify the borders and use them as the frame of these calligraphies. Yeah, they, they were very um, common. Um, no, we don't see them in these examples, but there were um, some that you showed before that had um, florals. And there was a question about whether those uh, floral designs were also done by the calligraphers or, um, or and at the time of, of their execution. Yeah, most of the uh, calligraphers were, if they were in royal courts, they were uh, in collaboration with illuminators. And we see that there are some examples that the calligraphy was done and the illuminator started to beautify the background. Uh, normally, the calligrapher was not doing the uh, illumination and uh, this decoration of the paper. But most of the times we see that, for example, there were one piece of calligraphy and uh, later on, they found it, wow, this is amazing. This is from this very, very famous master, or it's a beautiful piece. So they started to add the decorations later. So most of the times they were added later. Sometimes they were added um, simultaneously. Um, that was mainly for the manuscripts. 
efforts uh, about these kind of artworks that were either on individual papers as individual artworks or letters. They were not um, intentionally being um, illuminated at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we had a, a question also um, about whether any of the differences between the calligraphy in Arabic and in Farsi lie in the specifics of the language? Uh, yes, we do have this specific Persian script called Nastaliq, for example, which uh, is very much in harmony with Persian poetry, Persian language. It has um, these curves and uh, you see that the lines are arranged in a way that uh, they, they match the size of a couplet which we have in the um in, in persian poetry and they are probably they say this is the best for persian poetry but we have of course persian poetry written in other scripts um they are probably uh, very much um like connected arabic language with specific arabic um scripts and Persian language with a specific uh, Persian scripts. Um, we do not have, I think, anything in the Arab countries in Nasserlif, but Nasserlif later on went to uh, Ottoman world and uh, Mughal courts in India and in Turkey. And we see that they were producing lots of texts in Arabic language also with uh, Nasserlif. Of script, but mm -hmm. yeah, initially that is correct that they are reflecting um, the characteristic of each other. So I hate to put you on the spot, Shiva, but um, we had a question in the chat that aligned uh, with one of my own, uh, and that was um, you talked about the relationship between the orality and the visuality, and we were hoping. Uh, if it doesn't put you on the spot too much, would you be willing to read a line or two so we could get a sense of, of that as well? And then maybe um, a translation for those of us without your specific language skills? Um, reading something from these artworks that we have here, unfortunately, I did not include the beautiful poetries here. So most of these beautiful things that we are seeing, the writings are really texts that are not that poetic. <laughs> <laughs> Financial information that we were not meant to decipher. Um, <laughs> Choose so, whatever, you, whatever you like, Shiva. It's just to get a sense of the language and for us to look at the image at the same time. That would be wonderful. And that would have been great if I knew uh, that is coming, so I could probably go back to see if we find something like here. Um, this is a poetic language where it is not a poem. And it is uh, a love letter to a loved one. And uh, probably I can read it. لک نسیم طیب شمین که از جانب آن صدیق حمیم و رفیق کریم و رفیق حفیق حقیق maybe um, it is difficult to read actually and it is <laughs> it has to be um, vertical it, it is vertical it has to be um, horizontal but yeah so, so it is um, in the rhyme and it is poetic, it's beautiful. I wish I had something more poetic, like poems in front of me at the moment, but unfortunately I don't. Well, that was beautiful and I think um, our participants would agree. Um, I've learned so much um, from your talk you. today and uh, really appreciate your making this accessible uh, to us. And um, I think we all look forward to seeing it in person uh, one day uh, in our Art Studies Center. 
Um, I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us today. And uh, of course, thank Shiva uh, for this incredible presentation. Um, after you leave this session, you will receive a link to a short online survey, which I hope you will take uh, a moment to complete. We, we really do appreciate your feedback uh, on our virtual programming. And we hope you will join us on September 24th for another great Art Talk Live uh, with Francis Gajard Marquez, the Frederick Randolph Grace Curatorial Fellow in Ancient Art, who's back this time uh, with a talk entitled Crying Foul, uh, The Scary Truth About Ancient Sirens. So please join us for that and visit our online calendar for more information about these and other upcoming programs. So thank you again, Shiva, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Lynette.